After a couple months away, we have enough superhero content to bring back Superhero Pantheon for the month of March. Today, we look at the last superhero film to be released before the pandemic sent us all inside. Today, we reflect on Birds of Prey and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn on Superhero Pantheon Limited Edition. Ladies, if you want boys to respect you, you have to show them that you're serious. Blow something up. Yeah, hit someone. Nothing gets a guy's attention like violence. Oh, I love this chick. She's got rage issues. I don't have rage issues! Birds of Prey. Rated R. Experience in IMAX. This is the Superhero Pantheon. On this podcast, we take one superhero film a week and decide whether it should be in the Pantheon, the Pile of Shame, or somewhere in between. My name is Jerome Cuson. You can find me on Twitter at JeromeC1985. You can find additional episodes of this podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and all of your favorite podcast apps through the real world. We strongly encourage you to leave a four- or five-star review so as to help people discover this show and the great work that the folks at the real world are doing. If you would like to interact with us or send feedback, you could do so in two ways. First, send an email to Superhero Pantheon at gmail.com. Second, find us on Twitter at Hero Pantheon. My co-host for this week and every week will be Brian DeBrain. He can be found on Twitter at Brian DeBrain. Brian, we are amidst Superhero Pantheon Limited Edition. This is a month when we will be discussing a number of 2020 superhero releases, uh, plus WandaVision and the Stanley biography. So uh, this is uh, a very important month just to kind of run through this. And uh, what's what I think is really fascinating is we are going to be reviewing two of these movies. Uh, they have female directors, so I think that's pretty cool. And uh, Birds of Prey is a movie that I think I was a little bit warmer to uh, upon first viewing. And when we had our conversation last year, uh, we talked about this and we also talked about the Harley Quinn animated series that is now on HBO Max. But Brian, if I recall, I was a little bit warmer on this movie than I think you were. Uh, how how do you feel now about this movie upon second viewing? Um, everything works except the story seems lacking. And I'm looking at it now and I'm just or looking back now and I just feel like Hour and 45 minutes, so the script wasn't that long. I don't know. It just feels like there could have been so much more. Because leaving this movie the second time, I wanted to show on the trio, like the main Birds of Prey trio. Like that, to me, like by the end of the movie, that's the main story that I was focused on the most. Even though Harley Quinn's awesome in, in this movie because she's just awesome as Harley Quinn, Margot Robbie. Um, it felt like there was two movies going on at the same time and they had to mix both. But I felt like if you would have just done. Like, let's say they just split the movies and made two separate movies and did the same, like, kept the budget, but split the budget between them. You could have made an awesome Birds of Prey, gritty, you know, down-to-earth Joker-type movie for $10 million and keep it in the DCU and just keep it relevant. Because I think them as a trio in a down-and-dirty, gritty crime drama, which they were doing on their part of the movie, works so well. And you wanted more of Huntress by the end of it because she got so shortchanged that... Like, she had a dope origin story, and I mentioned this before, too, last year. Her origin story is, like, a dope movie that we never got to see for Huntress, and I just, it still feels like that. So it just leaves me wanting more, despite the fact that I think the script was just kind of lacking because they had to do so much. But I don't think it's necessarily the writer's fault. It's just she was given so much to put in that it kind of ended up jumbled at the beginning. And I don't know, at this point, sometimes everyone wants to, everyone wants to be Tarantino and do the whole flashback and tell things out of order and do it like it's cool, but sometimes it just doesn't fit the movie, and I felt like this movie would have just been better, you know, start to finish, instead of, like, doing the flashback as to why Harley breaks into the jail cell anyway, and then they do that 20-minute flashback, so I think if they just kept it in order, it would have been better, but overall, I think this is a very enjoyable movie, um, one of the higher-rated DCU movies, and very much enjoyable, um, it deserves a, a lot more viewing, I think, it's just kind of like they mismarketed it, a little bit, and I think they could have just dropped the R rating altogether and just 
if you're going to do Harley Quinn, make it PG-13. Because I think the core audience, obviously, is, you know, that 13-year-old tweener audience. So they kind of missed the boat on that. But other than that, it's a very enjoyable movie. Yeah, I really like this movie a lot. And I think it's unfortunate that it did have the R rating. I'm in total agreement with you. I am almost over the fact that you're even trying to do R-rated superhero movies unless it's for a very specific reason. Like, I think there is space for R-rated superhero content, like The Boys, for instance, or The Old Guard. Like, I get why those movies are R-rated, because you are trying to reach a more adult audience. But I think when you're talking the universe of Batman and you're talking about the universe of Marvel, with the exception of Deadpool... I think not making those movies PG-13 is a major, major mistake. And I think that's 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 the thing that I was thinking about even as I was watching uh, this movie as well, is that I don't think you have to go too far before you eliminate the R rating. I just think you have to take out some of the swear words and pretty much you're good to go with this being a PG-13 movie. Let's get into some of the notes because there's a lot of information out there about this film. So there's a point when Harley adopts a hyena in this uh, in this movie and in Batman the Animated Series and in the comics she kept two hyenas named Bud and Lou and they were named after comic duo Bud Abbott and Lou Costello originally there was supposed to be a trained hyena for Harley's pet there was one available but hyenas are extremely territorial and the production was warned they would not be able to reuse any part of the set that the hyena touched So instead of an actor in a motion capture suit for full CGI animal, a large dog was used with CGI enhancement added in post-production. Although cheaper than the other options, the effect was so expensive that the filmmakers could only have one hyena. Okay? So unfortunately, we only got one hyena, hyena Brian, but I think that is uh, is more than acceptable. Uh, Something else that happens when Harley Quinn is leaving the police precinct, she points to a wanted poster and says, hey, I know that guy. The wanted poster is that of Captain Boomerang, with whom she worked in Suicide Squad. Brian, that is a movie that exists. We have reviewed it, and I'm still just trying to forget it ever happened. Um, He's back. He's one of the few they brought back for the next Suicide Squad, so there's got to be some kind of planning there. And the fact that they had his specifically his face on the wall, and she mentioned him in, in, in particular, like, there, there's a plan there. And I know sometimes DCU doesn't know what they're doing in terms of planning ahead, but I feel like that little detail is tied into the Suicide Squad. So I think they did that on purpose, and I'm glad they're kind of keeping the continuity together. And I just, I do wish they had both, man, the, the both hyenas. And, of course, it's always a budgetary thing, and I was like, God, the budget must have been too much for it. But under the impression that I got, there were twins, right? Because... I'm assuming the one just died and the other one just showed up out of nowhere and then there was two of them. But that's, in my head, that's kind of the way I'm playing it. So, In addition, when Harley remembers her heart being broken before she met Joker, she recalls two males and one woman. The woman is animated in exactly the style of Poison Ivy in Batman the Animated Series. Now, I don't want to give too, too, too many spoilers away for Harley Quinn, but the one thing I can say and feel confident without spoiling that show is that that relationship is expanded upon in this movie, uh, on that TV show. So that is something that I find to be very interesting, is that Harley, or that Poison Ivy is mentioned here, and that their relationship gets discussed a great deal in the television show. And Kathy Yan who is the director of this movie. She is the first woman of Asian descent to direct a superhero movie. She is the second woman to direct a DC film after Patty Jenkins. Kathy Anna said that if she returns to Harley Quinn, she wants to explore the Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy relationship. So that is definitely something that would be very interesting. I'm not sure if it's going to happen in the movies, but it is something that we have seen a great deal in the animated series, and I just thought it was worth mentioning. Yeah, that's the movie that I want to see the most out of Harley Quinn. Because especially now that we watch season one and two, like that relationship is so complex now. And if you do that kind of relationship in the movie, you're in for a treat because I think a, you know, audiences are you haven't seen that kind of movie before. And I don't again, I don't want to mention spoilers, but it's a really interesting relationship that develops between them. And um, I think you know, again, you don't have to do like fifty million dollars of that. You know, it's a romance story. So I'm glad that like. There's talk of doing that because I think you could scale that down and just do like 20 million and do maybe a few explosions here and there. But I think that's a movie that can work. 
And I think that's what she wanted to do a little bit, but she kind of got thrown in with the Birds of Prey stuff, so they kind of had to mix that in. But, <coughs> excuse me, again, I felt like there was two movies going on, but I was enjoying one movie way more than the other. But this is definitely the Harley Quinn movie that I want to see now. I don't want to see the, the Joker stuff. We're way past that at this point. We didn't even need the Joker in this movie. Um, just let's build on that and her future. Because I think, I think that's going to be like the new thing in the future of the comics is that, you know, this duo of uh, Harley and Poison Ivy um, is going to be like a regular thing. And I want that to carry on the movies. You don't want the Joker, but Brian, we live in a society. Listen, I had no idea what that meant. And then when I fight, when I read the meme thing, I was like, God, meme culture is so weird. I just, I heard a line about society and people just blew up with it. But again, it's ah, Zack Snyder, man. But you love him, you hate him. But I can't wait till uh, March 18th. So. All I'm going to say, so one of the things that you might be wondering is, are we going to talk about the Zack Snyder cut of Justice League? And I'm here to tell you that I will never, ever publicly talk about that movie. Twitter this podcast ever if brian wants to do a show about that snyder cut he is more than welcome to uh but it will not it will in no way involve me either as the host of that show or editing that show so brian like i said if you want to do that podcast and you want to do a special edition have at it but i will have no part of it oh i've been thinking about it believe me and uh I don't even think I want to host because I just have all these like thoughts about it. So many thoughts about it for the last couple of years, but we'll see. I know this is a little off topic, but four hours is a lot. That's a lot of notes. There's a lot of background, but I just find it so fascinating and the tale of it all and the whole Joss Sweden thing tying into it at the end just makes a hell of a story, man. It does. It really does. And I think, I think five years from now, you'll watch the documentary about the making of the Snyder Cut, but not actually watch the Snyder Cut. I will watch the shit out of the documentary. I will read the shit out of the oral history because part of what is so amusing is the idea that Zack Snyder grifted Warner Brothers out of $70 million. And regardless of my feelings on Zack Snyder, that is tremendously entertaining. But let's get back to this movie and talk about Margot Robbie. She pitched the idea of Birds of Prey to both DC and Warner Brothers as a female-led superhero action movie, and they agreed with her vision uh, Margot Robbie is going to be one of the most important people in Hollywood over the course of the next 10 to 15 years, because not only is she, is she performing in these roles, but she is also a producer. She has her own production company, which is called Lucky Chap. And one of the things that Lucky Chap is doing is that they are actually running tr like schools and uh, workshops for female screenwriters. So you are going to see a lot from this production studio and it just makes sense that this is one of their early projects because it is a franchise and it's a way to uh, to get some early money. And undoubtedly, Margot Robbie is going to be playing this character in other films as well. Uh, this apparently was supposed to be the second movie of the quote-unquote Harley Quinn trilogy. She, of course, was in 2016 Suicide Squad. There are rumors, the possibility of a Gotham City Sirens. Who knows if that is going to happen, but she is slated to return in this role. In fact, if you watch the if you watch the uh, the sizzle reel of HBO Max for all of the movies that are being released day and date on the streaming service, as well as in theaters, the shot that they use from Suicide Squad is of Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. So that is uh, that is tremendously exciting. Uh, as well, just to see what the hell that movie is going to be about. I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of random death in that movie of some, uh, maybe even some prominent characters. Probably not Harley Quinn, though. See, that's the thing with team-up movies. Like, James Gunn gets it down right, I think. Like, he builds up the team, and then if he knows there's too many people, why even, like, make connections, just make up a joke out of it, you know? And I think that's what we're going to get with, like, all 20 people that are cast for the Suicide Squad that were not even in the first Suicide Squad. So uh, it's going to be fun. I think he's, he gets the concept of, well, you can't get to know everyone, so let's just kind of like knock them off one by one funny in a funny way. It's kind of like the way Deadpool did in Deadpool 2. So that's kind of what I'm expecting out of that. So I think you're alluding to something that's probably going to be in the first 10 minutes and we're all going to be laughing our asses off. And at least that's the assumption, is that they're going to knock off all these like characters in the first 10 minutes of Suicide Squad. But we'll, we'll see. I'm looking forward to Margot Robbie in that. And like her in like... Put her in, like, the next, I don't know, not every DC movie, obviously, but everything that fits what she can be in, just put her in there. Because I think her and Gal Gadot 
are going to be like the two that are just going to be like, oh, it's, it's her. It's like the recognizable faces, especially if Henry Cavill's not going to be around for a while. And we're not going to have a consistent Batman for a couple years. So I think those two can kind of carry the DCU for the next couple years until something kind of new um, pops up. But uh, yeah, I like her as like the face of the DCU along with uh, Gal Gadot. Those two are kind of like the faces of this franchise or the the whole cinematic universe in my eyes. It used to be, you know, obviously Henry Cavill at the start of it all, but because of this, um, she's gotten more screen time than Henry Cavill at this point, I think, almost. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to what's the future of the DCU, and the fact that she's producing, I think, helps a lot. And you never know, with her production company, she could pull it off and do the whole winning for Best Picture as produced, like, hypothetically, you know, like, win as producer and actor in the same night, and that's, I don't think that's ever been done, now that I think about it. Um, maybe Affleck was close, but he won for writing and producing, even though he acted in the movie. But again, it's super rare. And the fact that she's got that kind of power in Hollywood is great. Yes. Margot Robbie is a future Academy Award winner, and she is going to win for something, whether it is for acting, whether it is for producing, it is going to happen at some point. Let's get to the categories. Of course, we start with the heroes. Margot Robbie, we've been talking about her. Let's continue to have that conversation. Uh, she is pretty much the perfect choice for Harley Quinn, uh, looks-wise and personality-wise. Uh, we see a lot less of her through the male gaze because we have a female director. Uh, just the way that David Ayer directed her in Suicide Squad. Just a lot of tight outfits, and it was um, it was pretty repulsive at times. But in this specific situation, I think it worked out so well. And two specific moments that I think about with this movie that I don't want to say the word iconic because I think that word gets overused, but I think two of the most important moments from this movie, the egg sandwich scene, because they emotionally invest you in a goddamn sandwich, and uh, the moment where they uh, where she exchanged hair ties uh, with uh, Journey Smollett's character. That is also, that is a big moment uh, from this movie, and I think... It, I think that there are some issues that we'll talk about with the story itself, but Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, I think, is pretty much perfect. Yeah, she's doing a great job. She does a much better job here than Suicide Squad, for sure. Much more introspective and much more deeper in her thoughts, and, you know, we get to know her a lot better, you know, way better. So I thought they did a great job with that. Um, I love those little moments she talked about as well with the egg sandwich thing. I thought that was funny as hell. And um, there's a payoff to it at the end. She gets the egg sandwich at the end, so there you go. That's little details, man. Don't just throw random stuff in there and then have no payoff at the sandwich at the end, you know? Give us the sandwich at the end. That's that's It's a metaphor, people. So, uh, yeah, I like the way that that came full circle. And she does a lot of great job with the scenes she has. Um, you know, I just felt like you take her out of the movie, I think it would be this like a different kind of movie and you could still have the same kind of plot with um, Black Mask and everything, but... I don't know, she still did a great job, but I just felt like she was in a different movie at points, because it's, when it's all about her, that's like, you know, almost a totally different narrative than what's going on with with Black Mask. So it's it's kind of like, again, they kind of force things together, but she did a hell of a job putting it, uh, or putting it all together and kind of like being the lead role, even though, like... I wanted more of the other characters, but, you know, she's top bill, so that's that's the deal. I think it's really unfortunate because this movie does not get made without Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, but what I think makes that so unfortunate is that I think the movie itself would almost be better with her either in a supporting role or with her just not being in the movie, period, because what unfortunately happens is that we have three really compelling characters and three great performances by great performers, but all of them are kind of underbaked, and we don't really get a lot of development with any of them, not to mention that you have these villains that we also have to talk about as well. And what makes that so unfortunate is that you have Rosie Perez, Rosie Perez, who is not somebody who has been in a lot of big movies over the last few years because of the, the incidents of male harassment, and unfortunately, Rosie Perez seemed to be a victim of that and almost lose her career because of it. But I am really glad that 2020 what it was a resurgence for her. The fact that she was in this movie and the fact that she was also in the highly uh, acclaimed flight attendant the first season, at least. And I think Rosie Perez is great here as Montoya. 
unfortunately underdeveloped, but I love the fact that she is both an alcoholic, but also somebody that we can sympathize with. Uh, there is undoubtedly gender playing a major role into the fact that she cannot elevate beyond a detective, but we see her wits, we see her intelligence, we also get to see her be an ass kicker, and that's also something that you do not see in a lot of roles for women over the age of 50, and uh, it was great to see her in this movie. Again, even though the character is underdeveloped, the character of Montoya I think works out really, really well and ends in a very satisfying place. Rosie Perez is usually great in, you know, back in the day. Like, she was always great, always killing it. So it just sucks that her career took that unfortunate, you know, point where she was, she was labeled hard to work with, you know, by males, you know, and that's pretty much what she's going through living in this fucking office that she's in. That's so frustrating that it's just like, all these dudes are idiots and trying to like make her look stupid when she's the smartest one there with all the answers. And it's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure a lot of, a lot, a lot of females have gone through this and it's, it sucks and it's unfortunate. And these kind of like culture or office cultures or work cultures kind of develop into these kind of things. And it's just fucking frustrating. Cause she's got, she knows what she's doing. And all the, all the dudes are like second guessing her. Like she's crazy. And, and she's like, what? She knows what she's doing. What the fuck are you talking about? And the fact that you, they gave this backstory about how, She's never been promoted to what she truly is. Like, she's smarter than all of them, but everyone gets the promotion instead of her, and she never gets the credit. Like, I wish they built on that more. It's just they didn't have time to do it. So um, I thought she did tremendous in this movie. Like, I was glad to see her again in a movie, man, and she's just k- killing it. And it's almost like in a different universe, you can see her as, like, Miles Morales' is like mom or something in the MCU and just, like, give me that because I think that would work awesome or something like that. You know what I mean? And um, I'm glad she's back because I think she did. Like I always remember her in White Man Can't Jump, you know, when she goes on Jeopardy and stuff like that. And um, I think she's great, and I'm glad she's back. So um, I don't know. I just I wish I wanted you know I want more from this character. But again, I think I, if they do some kind of sequel thing, it should be an HBO Max series because you got to really develop these characters. Because I feel there's so much on the table to be done with these characters, especially with hers. Like she's definitely like the elder statesman of the group and she's seen some shit and we really got to get into what's, you know, really the painful, you know, the alcoholism. There's always a painful reason behind it. So we can get into that as well. I felt like there's a whole 60 minute episode of just great character development waiting with her. Yeah. I think that if they were to end up doing something with these characters, I think HBO max would be the logical place. And of course, journey Smollett is also an HBO star in her own right as, of course, she played a prominent role in the television series Lovecraft Country. What a year for t- what a 2020 for Journey Smollett. In a crappy year for everyone else, Journey Smollett uh, was a bit of a breakout as she not only plays Black Canary, uh, she gets to shine as kind of the ass kicker of the group, even more so than Harley Quinn. Uh, Journey Smollett's character is the one that actually saves her at one point. She can sing, she can fight, she has great fashion sense. Uh, Journey Smollett is great, and uh, like I mentioned last year, Brian, it's wild to think that Journey Smollett started on Full House, and here we are with her as a big star in two huge Warner Brothers slash HBO productions. Full House, huh? I guess uh, a lot of connections to Full House nowadays, right? With all the, uh, the Olsons and you know all those connections in the world and the sitcoms being parodied and all that kind of thing. Funny thing how you know everything comes full circle, and I guess it does here. Um, man, she was great. She's great in this movie. I felt like she should have been the main character. And again, I, I love fucking Margot Robbie and her performance, but you take her out, give her her own movie. And if you make the trio of the birds of prey, their own movie, this is the, this is the main character right here. And everything kind of built around her. I feel like she's the one that's undercover. She's the one that kind of gets the plot going. She's the one that gets Cassandra K going. You know what I mean? She's like, she's interacting with all the main players and everything kind of revolves around her actions based on the one de- decision of saving um, Harley Quinn from getting abducted, literally abducted. Um, that leads to her being the driver. That leads to her getting closer. That leads to her getting the diamond, all that kind of thing. So I felt like she was like the real main character of this movie in terms of like the writing. And I thought, man, I just want to, again, I want more from her. Like we get this background she's living in you know, this rundown apartment, but she's looking out for Cassandra Kane, the other little girl living in the building. So she's got that, you know, heroic sense of quality to her. And the other thing too is like, you know, she has superpowers, but she didn't use her superpowers until the end. It felt like it really 
there were some really cool sequences that we could have had, but they just didn't do it because they gave all the cool sequences to Harley Quinn. And that's unfortunate because, like, she, she annihilated a whole, almost a whole army outside with one shot, you know, one literal breath. And um, they, I, felt, I felt like they could have done so much more in terms of the action with her, too. But, you know, they, they wanted Margot Robbie in that role kicking ass instead of her. But she did get to kick ass, but I don't think they wanted her to overshine. I think that is absolutely true. And I think when you talk about underrated and underutilized, I think Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Huntress is perhaps the most underutilized character. She barely has any dialogue. She really isn't in the first half of this movie, save for one scene. And, you know, we do get a little bit of her at the end, but this is somebody who I have been a fan of, obviously, because of Scott Pilgrim. And she just has this way of delivering dialogue that I think really works for her. And it's really unfortunate that she did not get a more prominent role because uh, she is probably one of my favorite actors out there. And I think that her as Huntress, that is a great casting decision. But again, when you're not giving them enough dialogue, it's 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 tough to invest in her character. And she also has some of the funniest dialogue and some of the funniest moments in this movie, um, just judging by the fact of her name and what, what people call her. And uh, yeah, I really like Mary Elizabeth Winstead, and it's really unfortunate, even more so than Journey Smollett and Rosie Perez, who I think at least get a couple moments to shine. It really feels like Mary Elizabeth Winstead is a victim of having too much Harley Quinn in this movie. Yeah, the the flashback, man, that flashback where you see her origin story about her being a mob boss's daughter that gets killed, but she survives the attack and is going after all the people that fucking went after her family. That's a hell, that's an incredible movie within the movie. Like that's a movie that I am dying to see. And like the second time around, I was just like, God, I know they showed us the clips of the movie, but man, if they would have stretched that out into a whole movie, the the build-up to the final thing where she kills Victor's ass would have made so much more catharsis and would have made much more sense. But we didn't even get revealed that Victor Zaz, you know, the, the right-hand man of Black Mask, was one of the assassins that killed her family. And they don't even reveal that till the moment she kills him. So I was like, oh, why didn't you reveal that earlier? We could have had this build-up, and it would have been great. But they didn't do that, Rob, because, again, she's not the main focus. They want to, you didn't want to give that main focus to her. So it's unfortunate, man, because I think her character is tremendous, like tremendous. And you talk about the way she's delivering dialogue. It's almost like she's delivering this Kevin Smith style dialogue of like, oh, for fuck's sake. And, ah, oh, fuck this. And, you know, she's just, she's talking like Jay. And I was digging that a lot. And like, I like the way her character's put together a lot. And I just wanted more from her. And again, like, you know, give Rosie Perez a full episode on her origin give like two or three to Huntress, man, because there's like a lot there. And then there's, you know, there's a whole story about her learning how to be the Huntress based on being, um, because a bodyguard that was, that survived the attack or whatever, took her in or whatever. And there's a whole story there. So, and this movie is an hour and 45 minutes and it it plays well, but it just wants you more leaving, you know, wanting more about these characters. And I, that's great. But if they don't follow up, it's going to suck. So I really want follow-ups on, especially, the Huntress. Yeah, the Huntress. Uh, but I really like Ella J. Basco. Uh, I think she she doesn't get the credit. I think of the other the other three that we've talked about not really playing a prominent role. I hope there is a way to get her as Cassandra Kane in another movie because I love the 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 chaos that she creates and she is a lot of the impetus for the plot just based on the fact that she is the one who steals the diamond and apparently swallows the diamond and has to poop out the diamond. So I uh, I love this uh, this young performer and I hope that we can see her again as Cassandra Kane. Uh, Brian, I'll give you a chance to talk about Cassandra Kane, but my score is a seven. I I have a really hard time with this particularly because I love the performances, but the reason that I can't give this an eight is because the lack of development for Montoya, for Black Canary, and for Huntress in particular. I think Cassandra Kane, I think it still works, but I I do it, and it's it's a conflict because I really do love. Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. I genuinely love some of the scenes that she is in, but part of me wonders if this movie would be better off without her. And that's the reason that I'm giving this a seven. I think, like I said, all the performances still work, but I can't, I cannot say this is Pantheon level because I think there's something missing. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. A seven. That's exactly how I feel like exactly. Cause I just, I want 
more from these characters, man, but we don't have that, and it's unfortunate. We got so much Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's too much, because, like, you could have saved some of that stuff for, like, other move, like another movie with the Poison Ivy thing going on, but, you know, they, they wanted to have that focus, so I, I get it. She's the marketing, she's the main uh, um, image on the marketing, and you got to focus on her, and I get it. And Cassandra Cain, um, I hope she sticks around, and I hope she comes back in the in, in the next Harley Quinn solo movie, because that makes sense. Like, she even mentions that I turned her into my apprentice, and I appreciate that kind of dialogue when, everyone, when anyone uses the word apprentice, because I know... Yes, Star Wars uh, made that word famous, but every time I hear it, I just get giddy and think of Star Wars. So, um, even with Hugh McGregor in this movie, um, but yeah, I, I dig her character a lot, and I, I dig the whole like street kid, you know, getting into trouble. I like that aspect of it. It's become a trope, but um, it just works a lot well here. And um, I just hope she comes back and becomes like a bigger role in like a Harley Quinn movie with you know, not as many people trying to get so much screen time. So when it comes to the villains, there are really only two characters that we can talk about. I mean, if you want to talk about uh, the lieutenant in the police, the corrupt lieutenant uh, that keeps Montoya down, we can. But for me, it comes down to you and McGregor and Chris Messina playing Roman and Victor, respectively. Uh, they are a bit queer coded in some ways. They are. I'm not sure if they are a couple. It's never made clear, but it definitely is heavily implied that they either were together or are together. And I have a hard time with that because, I mean, I think it's a common trope to have queer-coded villain characters sometimes. And, um, yeah, like I said, not sure how to feel about that. But uh, Ewan McGregor is so great in this movie, playing Roman. He's out of his goddamn mind. This is a very good villain performance. Not only is he chewing scenery up and down throughout this movie, but he is menacing. He is a total creep at times. This is a performance that just works for me tremendously. And it's rare that you see Ewan McGregor in this kind of role. I think we're, we're so used to him uh, playing kind of the good guy role as Obi-Wan Kenobi or playing Danny in, uh, in Doctor Sleep. So this is a chance for him to kind of let loose. And he is, uh, he is very, very good. And um, I was a big fan of Ewan McGregor in this role. And um, I don't think we're going to see him in this role again, based on what happens at the end of this movie and him being shot. But I I would be all for Ewan McGregor returning to a superhero movie and playing a villain like this again, because uh, it's it, at times it's a little bit unhinged, but it really works for the movie very well. Yeah, he does some crazy stuff in this movie, really sadistic things, but sometimes he'll, to- he'll tone it back a little bit. And kind of like level out a little bit, you know what I mean? And then deliver some really like good dialogue. And despite all the craziness, like making <laughs> making that woman dance on top of the table and have her boyfriend like cut her dress off in front of everybody just because, you know, he thought that she was laughing at him. Shit like that is like, that's typical bil- villain shit, but the way that it's executed makes it even more villainous and creepy at times. Like he... You you were laughing at him, but also like creeped out about him at some points. Like, um, you know, at one point when he's like, he, it looked like he was gonna save the girl that was hanging upside down, but because she had a snot bubble, he was like, "Oh, gross, kill her anyway." <laughs> like, what? Like, that's such a great little quirk and charm about this character that I like a lot, and I like the way he's developed um, this black mask character. Um, I do like that he's obsessed with mask and he doesn't wear a mask till the end of the movie. And that's very deliberate, and I like that. And I don't know if he probably should have worn the mask earlier in the movie, but because at first it was like, what's this obsession with masks? He never wears a mask up until the end. So it, it made sense at the end, but I don't know if it was like a timing thing or they just didn't, you know, wardrobe department really didn't need it or whatever. But he does have the masks all along his uh, his penthouse, all along the walls and stuff. So I thought that was a really good touch because it's, you know, some character development that's really good. And then uh, Victor Zaz, Chris Messina did a great job. Um, at one point, there's, I think the line for me that really nails it for this character is Victor Zaz is like, um, I'm here to protect him. He, you know, um, he doesn't see these things. I'm here to watch out for him. That's why he needs me. And just that one line really justified Victor Zaz as a character for this movie. Like, you know, he's looking out for his lover, his boss, whatever you want to call it, but at least he's got a motivation. He's not just some henchman on the side, right? That gets no, you know, time or build up. And they gave Victor's ass time. He's a character from the comics. So I'm glad they gave him some, um, something to work with. And it wasn't just, 
cliche. It wasn't just, you know, corny dialogue. He did a really good job at being a psycho. And then at one point when he fucking gives the tranquilizer to Harley Quinn, like, oh, my God, what is going to happen? And, like, just the look in his eyes and the way he's got the scars and everything, he does a really good job being creepy, and I thought he did a great job um, being a really menacing kind of feel to it. Even when he's just, you know, talking normally, like, there's a sense of, like, he can do anything at any time. So I thought he did a great job as Victor's ass. So, um, yeah, I guess, you, yeah, there's a lot of assholes in the police department. They're heels. They're assholes. But uh, are they the overall villain? No. Do they take credit for Rosie Perez's uh, victory in the case? Yes. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to include them in the score. But overall, I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Um I think the writing was good, but if you had stronger writing for the characters, it would have been maybe eight, eight or nine even. But it's just, you know, Hugh McGregor's just having so much fun in this, and it's, you know, you can tell it's like a breath of fresh air for him. I mean, if the heroes are going to be underdeveloped, then the villains are going to get almost no development, and that's kind of what happens here. We know that Roman is obsessed with masks and kind of face facial things, but I think part of the issue, and this is something that superhero movies just have not been able to crack, is they are so obsessed with the idea that you need to see the actual actors that you are so hesitant to put them in masks. I think that's been true. That is not only a Marvel problem, but that is also a DC problem as well. Because think about how many times Spider-Man takes his mask off. All three versions take their mask off so frequently, and it really annoys me. So that is something that I hope that we can figure out at some point, and just put somebody in a mask for the entirety of the movie, and actually have it make sense. Um... So yeah, that's kind of how I feel. I think the reason the villains work is because of the performances. Just like with the heroes, there really isn't a lot of motivation beyond twirly mustache type things. So I'm also going with a 7 uh, for this. And uh, that's really all I have to say. Because again, there really are not a lot of villains. Uh, when it comes to the story, this is a story that is told out of order. We have an unreliable narrator in the form of Harley Quinn. The structure is kind of a mess at times, but I think part of that is by design. We get a lot of the focus being on Harley and the MacGuffin of the movie, which is the diamond. Uh, there's some great action scenes, though. Uh, one of the things that Kathy Yan did is to bring the, the fight coordinators of the John Wick movies to this movie, and it makes a huge difference because there are two really great action scenes, I would argue, the first one being Harley in the police station uh, where she uses glitter and various colorful things to shoot the cops and does not... They, they make it less dark by not having her just out and out kill the police, but uh, still damaging and wounding them uh, to the point where they will not be a factor for the rest of the movie. Uh, so it's great to just see her shooting around and glitters everywhere, and there are all these colors. It's really great. And the, uh, the third act action scene with all of the women fighting together, you've got Huntress, Black Canary, Harley Quinn, and Montoya all fighting together and fighting mostly men. I, don't, I think that's by design. And protecting Cassandra Kane also leads to the great moment with the uh, with the hair tie. I feel like that moment, you know, there's this moment in Endgame that's pretty famous now with all the women coming together. And the more that I get away from that moment in the theater, the more that I absolutely hate it. This feels so much more earned because there's at least a little bit more of a relationship. It is also not a, a quote-unquote girl power moment um, that it doesn't feel as forced, and I think it just I think it works out well. Um, from a story standpoint, this could have been and should have been PG-13. I think they could have very easily toned the language down particularly and ended up with a PG-13 movie, and I think this would have been a lot better. Yeah, the dialogue is just the... Uh... If you just drop the f bombs, yeah, it's totally PG thirteen. And the fact that we know, you know, Victor, um, he was blown up, but we that's that's PG thirteen. Like even the way they shot it, that's or the way Roman was blown up. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I think it's fine. You know, that's totally PG thirteen level. It's just the f bombs for some reason that they had to insist upon it, and that kind of hurts the the box office a little bit. But overall, the story, I, like I feel like there's two movies going on. One about Harley and then one about the Birds of Prey. And both are good. It's just you want more by the end of it. It feels like a Birds of Prey than you do of Harley. But uh, again, the whole out-of-sequence thing, I wasn't feeling it. Usually I, I love stuff like that in movies. It's out of order and then it makes sense when you put it together halfway through. But um, in this case, I felt it didn't need it. It just was there. And like um, 
some of the internal dialogue stuff with um, Harley, like when she's getting beat up and all of a sudden we see her do this Marilyn Monroe-esque dance. I thought that was kind of off. Like it didn't really fit the movie of like, why, why, why do we need that? Um, but again, they were just kind of doing some artsy stuff and I get it. Um, the third act builds up well. Like usually we criticize third acts on the superhero pantheon, but in this case, the third act I thought built up well with the whole army thing, the standoff, you know, gunslinger kind of moment kind of thing. But with the, with the girls and just them beating up everybody. And yeah, it was all dudes. Like every single dude in this movie was a horrible piece of shit. Um, I can almost confidently say that except maybe the guy who made the sandwich, he wasn't a horrible piece of shit. But I would say 99% of the males in this movie are pieces of shit. And that's by design because there are a lot of shitty human males out there. And uh, I agree. And uh, I'm, I'm used to seeing some of these kind of people in, in, in my workspace. Uh, you know, some of these guests at, at the hotel, man. Jesus Christ. But, um, but yeah, I get it. And that's by design and it's very well designed. And I, I, I like that aspect of it because it just makes it seem like, you know, all the dudes are just out to, you know, just manipulate all these women and they're just not going to take it anymore. So good for them. Um, but again, like the whole out of sequence thing really throws me off. They could have just done like from the start chronologically. And the only flashbacks you do were the hunters reveal. And that's all you really need to do. Um, but they just kind of went with it. So I'm going to give it a six despite, you know, there's a lot of good elements of the story. It's just, it's too jumbled up to make it coherent enough to enjoy it even more or even enjoy it. Like, cause I just really wanted like, I really wanted a $10 million version of this movie with just Montoya, Huntress, and uh, Black Canary. Like, that's that just works as it is, you know? And you can make it dark and gritty, street level. You can make that your R-rated movie at $10 million and get, like, a different audience. And then you do a PG-13 movie with Harley Quinn, and you, 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 you do get both. You get both audiences. So there's ways you could have done it. But I think now in the HBO Max era, quote-unquote, Things are different, and something like this, like you probably would just made the trio of, of them as the HBO Max, and just do Poison Ivy, and uh, and Harley as his own movie. So that's kind of how I feel about it. I'm gonna go with a seven here. I think I feel a little bit better about the story than you do, especially on a second viewing. I think the story comes together a little bit better. I do like the one hour and forty five minute runtime because I think superhero movies have gotten seemingly longer and longer, and now they're pushing two and a half hours, and the Snyder Cut's going to be four hours, and it's getting ridiculous. I like the fact that this is kind of one hour and 45 minutes, even with all the flaws that come with it being an hour and 45 minutes. I do appreciate that this movie does feel smaller scale, and there is a very specific focus on a MacGuffin that, look, it's a MacGuffin, so it's always going to feel a little bit trite, but I still think for the most part, uh, this movie is fun and very easy to watch. In a way, I think it almost plays better on streaming, even versus uh, the movie theater. Um, I, I'm very curious to know how this movie is doing on HBO Max, because I could see a world where, with no restrictions and the R rating and whatnot, and people just being able to watch it, and maybe people that are not 17 being able to sit down and watch this movie, either with their parents or sneaking away and watching this on their parents' HBO account. Uh, I would be I would be so curious to see how this movie did, because... Um, I think this is a crowd pleaser, and especially that third act with them all fighting together, I could definitely see this being um, not a cult movie, but definitely a movie that grows in popularity. Yeah, I see that a lot, too. Um, hopefully it's a good starting point, because, like, you know, there's a lot of good things that can come from this. It's just I hope they don't just abandon these characters, because I think that would be a shame, but... Yeah, I mean, I think the part of the issue is that DC does not know what they're... Like, we're still talking about the fact that DC does not know what they're doing, and I think we really need a Flashpoint movie to just clean up some of this. Hopefully. Hopefully. But uh, we'll see about that, because uh, the writer for this movie, she got hired to do Flashpoint. So you never know. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing, too. And we're going to get Michael Keaton as Batman again, and... I'm probably going to die of, of joy. You know what? I probably should say that. I probably should not call it Flashpoint because that's not the official title. I don't want people to get confused. It's the Flash at this point. There's no official confirmation that they're doing Flashpoint, just for the record. I mean, but Batman, uh, Michael Keaton, and Ben Affleck are supposed to be in it. So basically, it is Flashpoint. I don't want to get ahead of myself because something could happen. I don't want to jinx it, man. Let's just, let's, just, just, let's just hope Michael Keaton does actually film the scenes because if he doesn't film the scenes and it doesn't happen, then it's just what's the point. I don't want to jinx it. Then it's just, it's New Mutants all over again. Does it really exist? Did it really happen? 
Oh, I was I was in the car for 90 minutes. It, it did happen. All right, let's talk about the technical aspects of this movie. I think this is the strongest part, quite frankly. I think this is a very colorful, slick editing. I love the use of animation at the beginning. Um, I love the fact that there is a minimal amount of CGI. I think that might be one of the, my favorite parts of this, is that everything feels so much more tangible and real. The explosions look like they are happening. The action sequences, it looks like they're actually fighting. And it's not like digital stunt people. I love the fact that it looks so distinct from a lot of modern superhero movies because it is so colorful. Uh, I think, like I said, strongest aspect of the movie for me. I love the editing. Again, should there be more character development? Yes, but I do kind of love the one hour and 45 minute runtime. And I think it's for the tone that they're going for. I think it kind of works. So I'm giving this an eight. Eight as well. I thought the fight sequences were well done. I'm glad they pulled in the John Wick team. Um, choice of color was great. Like you mentioned, when you, she was shooting the, um, uh, what do you call it? I guess the, it was like makeup, I want to call it. Or like, it wasn't bullets. It's like rubber bullets, but with like makeup cake at the end or whatever. And it's all these different colors, so it just looked great. And then the the whole sequence where she, um, she doesn't do cocaine. She stiffs the air that happens to have cocaine in it. And gets all excited and just wigs out and just not kill but she really beats the shit out of those dudes with the baseball bat that was great it looked great and the fact that she broke like six legs in this movie harley quinn i think on three different people visually it's just like great stuff like it's it's the violence is where it's at has to be for it to take it seriously so i like that aspect i love the music the great music choices um some needle drops here and there but it, it all works you know what i mean and it fits the mood the only thing I didn't like was that weird sequence where she's almost having a concussion and she's having that Marilyn Monroe flashback. That just didn't fit at all. But other than that, um, very well done. Love the ending. Um, I love the fact that it wasn't like this big fight with, with Black Mask and Harley Quinn. Like it was this kind of like fake out. And then <laughs> really, it was Cassandra Cain that killed him. Um, and he just flies off the pier and that looked incredible. Good thing it was at night, because if that sequence was during the day, I think it would have been more gruesome, and that probably would have been a little too much. But I do like the fact that it was mostly shot during the day, and a lot of it was like LA exteriors that I recognized. I was like, oh, it's, I've been to that building. I've walked by that building. So that was really cool. Um, overall, I thought they did a great job. And I want to do a quick shout-out. I I don't know if you noticed, but Chad Gaspard was uh, had a cameo in this movie, and it's you know very unfortunate that he passed away the way he did, so trying to save his kid, but... Just a shout out to Shad because, uh, man, I I didn't even know he was in this movie, and when I saw it, I kind of felt bad. But um, rest in peace. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Uh, let's talk about the legacy of this movie. I think there we have to talk about the box office because this was not a box office bomb. I think there are some people that have tried to write it off as that, but it did not perhaps make as much money as people would have wanted it to. I think the confusing title hurt. Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of Harley Quinn is a mouthful. I think calling it Harley Quinn and Birds of Prey would have been better from the start, even if that kind of hurts what you're thinking about with Birds of Prey. The pandemic was also starting to take hold in other places, not the United States at this point, but I know it was still at least prominent starting in the, on the West Coast. So I think it's really unfortunate that this movie came out just as the pandemic was starting. And I think that did hurt at least some of the second run box office. Like if people were going to return and see this movie, there's also the R rating that doesn't help. I think this movie ultimately is going to be very popular because of VOD um, and being on HBO Max. And I think this feels to me, Brian, this feels like more of a quintessential female superhero story than even Captain Marvel in many ways, because it's multiple women from multiple backgrounds, a very diverse cast and I really like that about this movie. So, again, this is a hard movie for me to evaluate because I really, really enjoy it. But it certainly is not without its flaws. And even in assessing the legacy, it is it is not perfect. I cannot give this a Pantheon level score because the box office was not as good as it should have been. And it wasn't really an awards contender. So I am giving this a 7. Right now i got to give it a 6 just because the box office thing was kind of like... Uh, it shows you a lot because the audience of this movie is what tween tweenies, right? Like thirteen, twelve to eighteen, right? Like the main main audience at the hot topic audience. You see a lot of that, you know. If you go to one of hot topic the last couple of years, a lot of Harley Quinn stuff in the girl section. 
it just it sells a lot, you know. And I've actually talked to some like cashiers, like, does that stuff really sell? And she's like, yeah, a lot more so than you would think. And I was like, whoa. So that character kind of took hold of like a lot of uh, females of like you know that age. So I think making it R just kind of like, well, I can't see it now. I'm gonna have to wait and see it. So that really hurt the initial box office. I think that decision. And like I said, like, like we mentioned, like just drop the F-bombs and you're fine. And it would have been a PG-13 movie and you would have made even more money. But for some reason, it was just, I don't know. I think Joker affected that decision as well, maybe. Like that was a few months out, but they already had made the decision to make it R way before that. But I think Joker's success really was like, oh, maybe we should just go with the R. You know what I mean? And that kind of convinced him, but not really looking at the, you know, the numbers of it all and like the target audience of it all. So I think that affected it. So... We'll see how it terms it in terms of the legacy because it is recommended a lot lately, obviously because of all the DC stuff coming out and the Justice League stuff. But it feels like this movie doesn't get talked about as much as like even Shazam, you know. And I feel like in you know amongst the discussions of like the top tier of the DCU and blah blah blah, this kind of falls in the middle. But it just feels like more people talk about like some of the other movies, which is fine, you know. I think even people talk about Suicide Squad more, but that's just because of the the controversy with it all and all that kind of thing. But I don't know. I think give it some more time, the score might be higher. But right now, I got to give it a six just because it's not as buzzworthy as some of the other DC movies right now, even the older ones. Even though this is very good, it's just it doesn't have like that you know buzz. All right, so my total is a thirty-six, and yours is thirty-four, relatively close. So very close. So we are giving this a score of seventy, which means this kind of falls in between. Not the pile of shame. Not quite in our pantheon of movies. But I still think it's a very good one, and it'll be very interesting if we come we were to come back in a few years and assess the legacy of this movie. I think uh, we may have a different we may have different feelings on it. But overall, uh, I think this was still a very pleasurable experience, at least more pleasurable than what we'll be discussing next week. But we'll get to that in a second. Brian, let's go to the burning questions. We have not had a chance to do burning questions in a while, so we're going to bring it back here for Pantheon. Limited edition. Should there be a sequel? Simple yes or no question, Brian. Should there be a sequel that does not count Suicide Squad coming out later this year? Yes. Hell yes. What would you want out of a sequel? I'm in agreement. I'm going to say yes as well. What do you want out of a sequel? So do the HBO Max show with the Birds of Prey and then do the movie with Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn and Cassandra Kane. Split them off. They don't have to be together. You could have them cross over a little bit, maybe have a cameo or two, or maybe even have you know, uh, Harley Quinn in a full episode of the show, and then maybe have some characters pop back in on the other side, like, hey, I need some help. Can you come help us? And then that way you kind of integrate them together. Uh, I don't want to be boring, but that's basically what my answer would be as well. So uh, let's go to question three. How excited for you are for James Gunn's version of Suicide Squad? On a, let's say on a scale of one to ten and explain your answer. I love James Gunn, um, but I'm going to have to give it a six just because... Uh, it's a sequel to a movie that wasn't really well acclaimed or well received. And because of that, I feel like everyone's like going to just love it because, you know, it's going to be, it's way better than Suicide the first one. So it's just like, it's almost a give me of how much better this is going to be than the first one. But like, I don't know. I just, mm, I kind of want more main character stuff from him, but he's playing with the B and C level characters and that's his kind of thing. So I get that, but, I don't know. It feels like I, if he was going to do another DC movie, do something bigger, but it feels like Suicide Squad is kind of like a step below. Here's the thing that I'm excited about with this movie is James Gunn does a great job with Guardians of the Galaxy. I think what he is was able to do is he basically turned Guardians of the Galaxy from a D-level superhero team into kind of the A squad. And to the point where they were prominent features of the Avengers movies. I mean, you think about it, just think of how important those characters are to the events of Avengers, Infinity War, and Endgame. I think a lot of that has to do with James Gunn. Is the same thing going to happen with Suicide Squad? I don't think so. But think about the potential that exists for for some of these characters. I mean, John Cena's going to get a television show that is going to be on HBO Max because of this. And I think that's very exciting and that's very interesting because I think John Cena has been very good in almost everything he's been in up to this point. So, I'm a little higher than you. I'm going to say a 7. Um, the first Suicide Squad was so bad that I almost can't give it an 8, 9, or 10. 
but I'm genuinely looking forward to whatever James Gunn puts forth because he has earned the right to fail and he's also earned the right to be successful. I'm also curious to see if he has a chip on his shoulder after everything that went down with Disney. Curious as well. He's also, he's also rocking the the old man look. I don't want to call it the old man look, but the gray look. He's at that age where he's just like, fuck it, I'm embracing it. So he's he's kind of transforming himself right now. And hopefully it leads to, you know, more successful ventures in the future. Because I'm worried that Suicide Squad will be good, but not as spectacular as like Guardians. And then it's going to kind of have a backlash a little. I'm hoping that doesn't happen. But it just feels like we're expecting so much because it's James Gunn that I feel like it's going to end up as a disappointment. But I hopefully I'm wrong, because like, I hate when we build stuff up and then you get so disappointed. Maybe I'm just kind of protecting myself a little bit from that. What is the future of the superhero DC universe? Whew. Well, if they're going to do this Flashpoint storyline that I don't want to officially confirm, because I hope that doesn't jinx it or whatever, um, if they reset it, you know, keep the same elements that are working, like leave this stuff alone, the Birds of Prey stuff, the Harley Quinn stuff, Maybe just recast the Joker and just explain it later. I don't know. But if that's what they're going for, rework it all. Because then let's have some, like, continuity. Because at this point, we were praising DC for being, like, let's get away from trying to integrate everything together and just make individual good movies. They've been doing that for a few years now. And it kind of backfired with Wonder Woman 1984. So I think they got to kind of put things back on track and start putting things together. Because this whole thing with WandaVision and everyone's getting obsessed with it. Right, and how it's tying everything together from the X-Men and the Fantastic Four to the whatever, the Avengers. Um, I think you need that buzz going for the DCU again. And it's not going to happen with the Snyder Cut because it's a one one and done thing. Like, they're not going to go back to that continuity. So at this point, reset the continuity and build from there and give us something to look forward to and then tease us with a bad guy and kind of go from there. Because I think you need, like, something to look forward to in the next five years. It's just, at this point, all we are looking forward to is the Flash movie because... We're all kind of curious to see what it's going to do after that. So if you're going to kind of rely on that, then set something up fresh. It seems like DC it just continues to not know what to do with itself. And I think Wonder Woman 1984 has done a lot of damage because I, I, think, I think Wonder Woman 84, if that movie is good and it's successful... I don't even know what success even looks like with that movie. But I think if the, if the online buzz is better with that movie because there's so much wrong with it that I think it really soured a lot of people on DC and just created a lack of confidence. And I think a lot of it is just the uncertain future of the Warner Brothers studios with them putting everything into streaming. Like with Disney, Marvel is a a machine at this point and it's going to be really hard to break off of that machine and to kind of go off off kilter, so to speak. But DC doesn't have the level of quality control. They have a lot of issues. They have issues not just with the quality of the movies, but the Joss Whedon scandal, the Zack Snyder debacle and giving him $70 million. And yes, there are going to be people who watch and enjoy the Snyder Cut, but it's not going to be a lot of people, and people are going to end up making fun of that movie more than they are going to be actually enjoying it. So... I don't know what the solution is. I'm obviously intrigued by what Batman is going to deliver. But again, Batman was successful with Christopher Nolan and the rest of the DC universe was still floundering. And then there's also the CW of it all. You know, you're looking at a situation where Arrow has been canceled. Supergirl, Supergirl and Black Lightning are both going to be ending their runs after this season. Uh, Flash, who, who knows how many more seasons that show is going to be able to go. I believe they're at season six at this point. So how many more seasons of The Flash are we going to get? And I think there's a lot of questions about what the what the future of that part of the universe is going to be as well. And I think the idea of what's going on in the animated part is probably the most intriguing with the rumors of a potential sequel to the animated series, a direct sequel to the Batman animated series or even Batman Beyond. That's something I would be very excited for. I'm, of course, excited about the Harley Quinn animated show. So I don't know what to make of the DC Universe. All I know is Wonder Woman 84 soured me on a lot of their plans. I feel you, man. And at least I'm excited for the animated for sure. Because when they did the whole reset, uh, was it two years at this point? I guess the whole uh, Apocalypse War, everything kind of reset with that. So they started a new continuity. They're willing to take those risks in the animated universe and we... 
you know, we, we've talked about those movies before, and um, they do a hell of a good job and a great job in a lot of those movies. So that has a great future. The TV shows, on the other hand, I don't know, because, like, I, I only watch Flash. I never watched Arrow. Flash is my guy. Arrow's gone. Uh, I was going to watch the Superman series, but now that I see it, that they're doing the whole WandaVision thing where they age the kids, like, super quick, like, what the hell's going on there? So, again, with the whole crossover event with the Crisis on Infinite Earths, that screwed things up and changed a lot of things. So, all of a sudden, Superman has two grown kids. So, there you go. Uh, a little weird, but I don't know how I feel about that. But, uh, again, the DC, I think the DC shows are going to end pretty soon, their continuity, and just start fresh soon, because they're running out of ideas. They already did the big crossover and the multiple Earth thing, so I don't know, but uh, I do want to watch Stargirl eventually, because that's almost its own continuity, but we'll, we'll see if I get to that eventually. But yeah, Harley Quinn, season three, please. Season three. Yeah, which apparently is going to come out at the end of 2021, early 2022, so that's exciting. Uh, being animated really is helpful during a pandemic, because people can record and animate remotely. Brian, this is a bit of a tease for next week. Are you ready to prove the existence of New Mutants? I think I'd just rather watch people play chess. 